Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Happy Monday. We're recording on a Monday. I feel like we've been recording on Mondays lately. I don't know why that is, but... I don't know why that is. A great start to the week, though. That is... Maybe that's why. probably it. Speaking of great starts, Brett, (laughs) I didn't really have a transition. (laughs) No, that was... So my question for you today is, besides your partnership with me and your marriage to the lovely Lauren Amron and those three amazing children that you have, what is an accomplishment? How about this? An accomplishment, not the accomplishment. An accomplishment that you are proud of. And actually, it doesn't have to be professional. In fact, I hope it's not, but give us some. Getting up and getting to work today is an accomplishment, isn't it? Yes. Not really. That's not really what I was looking for. I'm looking looking for for something something a little bit more meaningful. Something that you reflect upon, you think... Yeah, that's pretty cool. I did that. That was cool. I did Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's... uh, I mean, yes, getting to this stage of my career, which I think talks about partnership with you and partnership with my wife and my children. But I'd say, I don't know, one thing I guess I can point to is, you know, completing a ultra 50K, completing other endurance events because you challenge yourself, you push through the pain and sort of some of the monotony and you, because you have to train for it, right? So you have to stay on track with training, right. requires discipline, commitment, and just sort of grit and grinding it out. Was there ever a time during any of those that you thought, I'm not going to make this, or that you seriously considered turning it in, stopping? Yeah, I mean, there's always a time when you're like, boy, can I? I mean, there's always doubt that, that sort of gets into your head when you're in the middle of a you know 32-mile race or a trek or you know whatever. So there's always some of that doubt that comes into your head. It's normal. So that's part of the mental component of just pushing it away and saying, no, I, I got it. I did a race that required an out and back and then two loops. And after the first loop, you cross the start finish line. So I saw the parking lot where our car was parked. (laughs) And I was like, you know, I could just, there's the car. And thankfully I pushed through, but normally I do that. So how about you? I'm glad you did. I'd like to know other than your accomplishments in your career and of course your family and your wife and bringing that awesome water bottle to work today, what would you say would be an accomplishment of yours that you take great pride in? Yeah. I mean, similar to yours. I mean, I guess the longest swims I have done have we've done a couple of six Ks in Maine in cold water. And each one of those is is tough. I would probably say I got my black belt in karate when I was much younger. And for me, that was a struggle. And Mm -hmm. I had previously failed one of my tests. It was very rigorous testing. And as part of the test, you had to break four sets of three boards, one with each limb, failed on one of them. And it was the first time in my, really in my life that I had failed at something, you know? And I said, all right, I'm never going to let that happen again. And so Sometimes, you know, the only way we learn is from failure or something close to it. So 100%. for me, I learned a lot from that experience at a young age. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that, Brett. Let's wake up our guest. Let's wake up our guest. <laughs> she left. Our guest today is Tanisha Wright. Tanisha is a brand new Florida lawyer. She graduated from the University of Miami School of Law, cum laude, where she was a recipient of the Dean's Certificate of Achievement Award in International Human Rights Law. She also received the CLIA Outstanding Clinical Team Award for the Innocence Project and the University of Miami's Litigation Skills Program Award. If that wasn't enough, during law school, she served as a research assistant. She was actively involved in the Black Law Students Association. She worked as a clinical intern at the Miami Law Innocence Clinic. And she held a role in the Law Activity Fee Allocation Committee. She also interned for the Honorable Robin Rosenbaum at the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. And perhaps most importantly, her highest achievement so far, she was a summer associate at the prestigious insolvency litigation law firm called Bast Amron. Well, I you think she's outdone that, right? Because now she is a And now lawyer, she is firm. an attorney practicing full-time at Bast Amron. Welcome, Tanisha. Welcome, Tanisha. Thank you. You made me sound so awesome. You made yourself sound so awesome. <laughs> That's right. 
That's right. Congratulations. And by that, to I don't you. mean that she wrote that intro. I mean that you accomplished all those <laughs> incredible you. achievements. Well, she did write it. She did write it. Not physically putting the words on paper. She, she wrote it she with. She made those things that's happen. That's right. Exactly. So, congratulations to you on your success. It's really been an impressive path here. How do you come to do so much in law school? I mean, how did you find the time to? to balance all those extracurricular activities? I mean, I think that a lot of what I would call high achievers, type A personalities, a lot of people in law school learn early on that you have to manage your time. It's not really about being able to accomplish all things at once, but learning how much you can fit into a day or rather than spending time on TikTok or Facebook like you really want to do, allotting that time for things that other passions that you have professionally or things that you have to get done. So I think that I learned that early on just just throughout the course of my education and being a military brat, I think that I also had parents that were very structured like structured and taught me those skills early on. So we'll get back to that and what got you to your work ethic, but what drew you specifically to the Innocence Project? Why'd you get involved with it? I actually didn't know about the Innocence Project until I think my second semester or third semester, well, actually my second semester at school. And a friend who was interested in the Innocence Clinic at school was telling me about how awesome it was and... He inspired me to imply myself, apply myself after reading about some of the things that the Innocence Clinic at Miami is all about and what the Innocence Project of the National Innocence Project and the project in Florida is all about. And I just thought the message was very inspiring about helping free innocent, wrongfully convicted people from terrible life circumstances. Right. So I was actually going to ask you for the benefit of those listeners who don't know what the Innocence Project is. That's... That's the yes. global or national objective. And is there some something that's different about the Miami version of the University of Miami Law School? Yes. Well, I can't necessarily speak for the Florida Innocence Project right. or the National Innocence Project, but I know that for the Miami Clinic, which is headed by Craig Trucino, our clinic director, our number one criteria for the Innocence Clinic is innocence. We have like several criteria that we look at when we're reviewing cases because it can get difficult, especially for students who have the, I want to save the world mentality, which I think is valuable. We have to calibrate according to our resources and we can't take on every case. So we have like a number of criteria that we have to follow so that we have what would be a good case that we can devote our resources to our limited resources too. And one of the first one and foremost one is innocence. Innocence, right. Yeah. Were you wrongfully convicted and tell us why you believe so or the circumstances that led to your wrongful conviction. So one of the first steps is that you, as part of the clinic, are ascertaining if they are in fact innocent because I assume lots of individuals that are serving time claim innocence. Yes, exactly. A lot of people do. And the reality is that When you have a long time that you are supposed to be in prison, whether you're innocent or not, you're going to reasonably go through every avenue to try to get out. And we have like a list of criteria that all the students have, like a sort of guideline to keep us all like structured in our approach. But our intake procedure is like inmates will send letters to the Miami Law Innocence Clinic explaining like their case and some of their background information. And from there on, we usually send like an application asking more specific and directed questions. And based on those answers, we either conduct a further investigation or perhaps like put them in a folder for like, maybe we can come back to this case later. And then other times, Whether we think they're innocent or not, like there are some cases that the Miami Law Innocence Clinic specifically just doesn't take. Right. Can't take them all. So for purposes of, so you heard about this when you were in law school, your first year, second semester from a friend. So for any students out there, prospective students out there, would you, that, that may or may not know about it, would you have any words for them or advice for them? Oh, 100%. Just join the clinic. I think that it's a good way to do public service. And that really applies to all the clinics at Miami Law. They're all great. But the Innocence Clinic, 
there's just something so valuable about, I mean, I think that comes with a lot of lawyers position, no matter whether you're a civil lawyer or a criminal lawyer, you're helping people in the most scary time in their life. And with the people who are writing to the Miami Law Innocence Clinic, a lot of the time, those are people who were turned down by so many other people. And this is kind of like the last hope. And to be able to aid someone, hopefully, in their case is just so rewarding. And it also gives you hands-on experience that you're just not going to be able to get in a classroom necessarily. Yeah, And I love that it starts with, you know that you're representing someone who's innocent. Right. Or you you have a conviction, you know, you're confirmed that they are, or you have confirmed that they're innocent. Yeah. And our director would just not take a case that he does not believe in. And I really respect that about him because those are just very tough decisions to make. And a lot of our interns, including myself, struggle with mail intake because you do want to help everyone. And sometimes there are people that might meet the criteria for innocence, but don't necessarily meet the rest of our criteria. And it's always hard to turn down those cases. Let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned being a military brat, um, yes. which we mean in the most positive sense possible, yes. just that you moved around a lot, right? Yes. Talk about your youth and what led to the work that you think, what led to the work ethic that you have today kind of led to where you are right now. <laughs> it's funny. I, I guess this is a personal story. I don't tell often, but... Well, you're about to tell it publicly. To our millions, I, I know. Three millions of listeners. Exactly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was born in Germany, right? I would say born and raised kind of until like a total of 10 years, we'll say I spent in Germany. My mom is German. My dad is American. And so they have that love story of meeting on a military base in Germany and falling in love and starting a family. And when I was born, my Tante Andrea, Tante means aunt in German, she looked at me and told my mom that I am destined to be a nerd. And a nerd? A nerd. A nerd. <laughs> at what age did she look at you and say that? The day I was born. Really? My Tante Andrea okay. looked at my mom and said, Mariella, das wird eine Streberin. And that means she's going to be a nerd. So is this a translation issue, though? Is the is it nerd <laughs> in a... Because nerd in the U.S. But well, there's a whole movie. English, there's there's well, a whole movies about but it. But it tends to have... <laughs> It tends to have a sort of a sort of a negative impl- implication, but not. You know, I wouldn't the say academic. I, I or think that she you'd meant smart academic. Right. Um, right. I think she meant it in the most loving of ways. Right. Yes, I <laughs> you're destined to be an intellect. Yes, that okay. would be a much nicer way okay. of saying it. Thank you. <laughs> and I use the word nerd in the most positive of ways. I'm proud to be there. You go. So called nerd. I think she was kind of right because I've always liked school and. I guess it's just like comes from my parents. My parents were like relatively speaking compared to other friends I might have had. They were not strict parents. But when it came to school, I did have to be on top of my game. It's like all my dad really cared about. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not all he cared about, but it was definitely a priority. And I think that comes a lot from his own background and the time that he grew up in. He always says that his mom was just worried about getting him to school and him going. And he takes pride in the fact that he can focus on the next level of that and make sure that I come out on top, get good grades, get a good education. And then when we moved to the United States for the first time, English was my second language. I did not speak any of it. I did try to speak English to me in Germany, and I just refused because I was stubborn and was like, I will never need to speak English, so <laughs> why bother learning? And, and they didn't teach me. it, and they didn't teach it in the school that you were going to? Not yet. So okay. in most schools in Germany, they do start English at the second grade, just mandatorily. Mm-hmm. Mandatorily, I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> we'll go with it. <laughs> we'll go with it. They are required to start in the second grade, but that's exactly when I Mm -hmm. went to the United States for the first time. And my dad knew that I would be left behind if my parents did not pay particular attention to me and my education transition in the United States. So he actually made my mom go to school with me for three months and translate everything so that I wouldn't be left behind. So in the second grade, when you were in the second grade here in the U.S., your mom 
would actually go to school with you and yes. translate. Yes. Because they didn't have German English they translators, I would assume. They right? did not. And not a- they had ESL courses, of course, and this is not to speak any no, English, negative second language. language yeah. yeah, but my dad just, I think that he didn't trust to leave it in anyone else's hands. He wanted to make sure that I was okay mm-hmm. himself. Sure. So he somehow managed to get my mom into the classroom and help lead the way for three months. And then after that, I think at some point they told me that I said to them, like, I don't need you to go to school with me anymore. Like, I got it from here. And so, yeah. Sounds like your aunt was right. Wow. (laughs) Yes, my my aunt was right. I wonder how much of that was, you know, a manifestation, because I assume you were told that story throughout your childhood. So if somebody's saying that, hey, you're this wise person said you're going to grow up and be a, you know, a great intellectual person, maybe you said, oh, all right, I am. Maybe a bit of self-fulfilling prophecy there, yeah. I like it. Right, you have to say it, speak it into existence, right? My aunt was manifesting for me. (laughs) And, And credit to your parents, both of them, for one, insisting on that, you know, and making yeah. it happen and because really just ensuring a transition for somebody at that age, because I'd yeah. imagine that the ESOL programs, they're obviously focused on English, but there's probably not a lot of German speakers in no, those programs in the U.S. It was schools. Georgia too. So. so in Georgia, right. <laughs> so, wow, really very impressive story. But the confidence instilled in you by your family helps, right? Like, it's not that if you don't have that confidence instilled in you by others that you won't succeed, but I suspect, and I don't have the numbers, but I would suspect that the chances of success go up on an order of magnitude because of the support and the confidence that your family had in you and the support mechanisms that they put in place. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I would not be anywhere I am today without my family and the support they've given me. So we're going to cut that. We're going to send it off to your parent. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to, this might be the first episode of the practice podcast that they listen to. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> it's yeah. Tanisha's nodding. So. Yeah, you're like, saying they're not yeah. listeners? Okay. <laughs> So, how'd you end up going to law school at the University of Miami? You grew up in Georgia, Ger- Germany, and then Georgia. Well, Germany, Georgia, Texas, back to Germany, and Virginia, I would say, is my home base in the United States that I spent the longest time there mm. in that state. Went to UVA for undergrad. I think I ended up at Miami because, to be completely honest, when I was looking to go to law school, you somehow get on email servers and schools send you brochures. Like, we've seen that you are applying to law school and we think you should come to us. And I got this wonderful brochure from the University of Miami that talked about the parrots and the hammocks that they have during studying (laughs) and the beautiful lake and all the great things about UM. So, so proud to be an alum right Parrots now. Parrots and hammocks, man. That's <laughs> so, so proud yeah. to be an alum right, right now. They were like, you know. Yeah. It worked. You could study <laughs> with parrots around the, the, on, <laughs> by the trees around you. I'm like, yeah, that actually does <laughs> sound pretty nice to be right by the beach. But I think, honestly, I think I ended up at UM because it was time for me to set out on my own. And it was extremely scary. I've never been on my own like that before. I mean, of course, like I went to undergrad and I was on my own there, but to be that far away from my mom and my dad and I don't have family in Florida. So I really was, anyone that would care enough to help me really was a flight away. Mm. And in terms of like how I ended up in law school in general, I think that there was like a time where I had a close, like someone who was close to me going through the judicial process himself. And it was terrifying to navigate the judicial system, not knowing anything about it and not having anyone around to explain it to you. You know, other people are fortunate enough to have lawyers in their lives, family members who could support them that way. But me and the person I was close to did not have that. So I think that was the first time where I was confronted with like secondarily through the legal system head on and it was scary and I didn't want to feel like that ever again. Mm -hmm. You know, knowledge is power. And I was like, I think I'm going to arm myself with this knowledge. And then, you know, everything that happened over the summer with George Floyd, I think added to that. And 
I just didn't ever want to be caught in a position where me or someone else I care about would not know what's going on. I, mm. I'm going to be the one to make sure that they know what's going on. So. And, and this person that was going through this struggle, was there ultimately a happy ending to that story? or I would say so. Okay, good. Yeah, a lot of stress in between. Of course, yeah. But, yeah. So transitioning to now you're a full-on, full-fledged lawyer. You've gone through three years of school. You took the bar examination and passed. Yes. And now you're a full-fledged lawyer. So what is the biggest surprise, if any, that you've encountered in now becoming a full-fledged lawyer and practicing and not being in school anymore and sort of having that experience? I guess the biggest surprise to me since starting law school about what I thought being a lawyer was is just how much outside of the immediate firm or your immediate job responsibilities there is to being a lawyer or what I would define as someone who wants to become a successful and impactful lawyer. And I think I learned that a lot coming from my experience with working at this firm because I'm surrounded by successful lawyers who are networking and uh, members of organizations. And it doesn't just stop at doing your projects and going home. There's other things to being an attorney, like being a community leader. Those things surprised me. And I think it took some adjusting to really put the full weight of my effort into doing those things. But that's been a pleasant surprise for the most part. I think, you know, it requires a lot of hard work and you have to be ready for that. But I feel ready. Great. That's pretty insightful too, because a lot of lawyers don't learn that lesson maybe until late in their careers. (laughs) Yeah. And now I think it's even more different because of social media. We have LinkedIn now. Mm -hmm. And I think that you always had to, I'm sure you always had to network, like even in previous generations, but now we are always accessible and marketable through internet platforms, which makes the pressure that much harder. And it sometimes it bleeds into, intentionally or not, into personal life too, right? Yes. Things that you do in your personal life. And one of the things we talk about here is you're always a lawyer. Yes. Right? You can't turn that off. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be working all the time, right? You also can do things for fun, and but you're always a lawyer. If you're out at a music festival, you're a lawyer. Yes. And decisions you make there can impact your ability to practice law. Yeah. And I think that it applies to even, you know, I think that's just a really good general rule to have, even if you're not a lawyer, especially with people that are having an internet presence, Mm -hmm. there are still frequent reminders. I think they had these in my orientation uh, where your online presence and what you say online can and will come back to haunt you if you're not careful about the message you're putting out there. Yeah. So if you don't mind it being on the front page of the paper and having your parents read it or your family read it, then great. But if you even have a hesitation then either consult with people who are maybe more experienced or don't do it. Yeah, right? I've definitely written way less things down <laughs> ever since I <laughs> became a lawyer. Not because they're horrible, but like just by your rule of thumb, you sure. know, I think most people don't want their private messages on the front of the news. So. Right. And even, by the way, in crafting emails, yes. uh, whether it's internal emails or external emails, there may be a time when you there's an exchange going on with opposing counsel and it starts to escalate because it's easy to type an email and send it, Yes, you know, and that's easy. You get to hide behind the screen and the computer and all the distance between you and the opposing lawyer, as opposed to either being face-to-face or on the phone or on video. And so take a pause, don't hit send, don't even put the name of the person or the email address in the two, you know, on the line to whom you're going to address it and type it. That makes make you feel better. Yeah. Walk away, right? Come back, reread it. And then, you know, a lot of times you're going to hit delete. And definitely, yeah, do not type emails angry. Right. Think twice before you send something. Right. <laughs> right. Those are very good rules of thumb. Well, I'd say she's right. ready. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, and it also doesn't, like, to your point, it also doesn't just end with, you know, the social media piece, LinkedIn, those, those are one aspect of our responsibilities as successful lawyers. But you mentioned it being a part of a community and networking. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think you see us, like when we started out, Brett and I started, there, there was no social media. That wasn't even a thing. And so you were solely limited to networking. A lot of lawyers didn't do it. A lot of them to this day don't do it. A lot of them don't do the social media. And they have you know, a certain path and then others, you kind of need to do all of it. I think the fact that you've caught on that 
all of it is really necessary. You have to do a little bit of everything. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to do it all when you're a young lawyer. Most important thing is own your skills, but your awareness is, to me, you know, gives you a leg up over your peers yeah. that aren't doing it. Well, it all depends on your personal goals too, right? If you don't want to grow up to be the most, I don't know, liked or referenced lawyer or attorney, if you don't want to be that well known, then maybe social media and networking and all those things aren't as important to you. Everyone has to do what is right for them, you know, and calibrate according to your goals. Yeah. So other than coming to work on a daily basis, what else do you do for fun? (laughs) You like how I phrased that? That was impressive. I know. It's good. I guess I like exploring. I like traveling. Traveling is obviously costly and takes time. So when I'm not traveling necessarily, I like checking out local spots that are new to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Miami has so much to offer in terms of uh, just nature and just different. I call them like, not me personally, call them holes in the wall. Mm -hmm. Just different. There's so much character to this city that I really have enjoyed getting right. to know Miami. What was the yeah. last place you explored? Most that recently? is noteworthy. It's noteworthy, <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah. Oh my gosh. Or if you can't think of that, then what was, what's your one, one of your top, there. one of your top favorite spots? I think my top favorite spot in Miami so far is Hammock Park. Mm-hmm. It's very not touched by any kind of construction. The people there are super nice. People take their dogs there. It kind of reminds me of the wooden parks that I know and love in Virginia. It's about Hammock Lakes? Or uh, no, where I is this? Where is Hammock Park? Yeah, It's by the Grove. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's definitely one of my favorite parks. Okay. Yeah. Miami has lots of, I call them hidden gems, whatever you yeah. want to call it. There's so many activities and places and cultural events that so few people know about even. Yeah. And I think a lot of people come to Miami, they go to South Beach, they go to Bayside, maybe they hit the Wynwood Walls, you know, they hit the top three the know, touristy type touristy spots, yeah. Yeah. areas, Ocean Drive, and then they leave and they think, wow, I saw Miami and there's so much more to Miami, so much more character. I agree. And, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with hitting the touristy spots oh, if yeah, you're a tourist. They're um, awesome. Even if you're a local, but I just had my cousins from Germany visit me and one of them, Thailand, he was in the United States in general like for the first time and it was his first time in Miami and he listed all the touristy spots and I was like, that's fair. And we're going to go. But I'm also going to take you to a bunch of other stuff yeah. that right. yeah. you don't know about. And How I, fun has that got to be? Oh, to they taste, enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, for you too, people. right? Yeah. For the first time. Yeah. yeah. To see their reactions. Oh, and yeah. Did yeah. they and like it? They're they coming back? They want to come back this year. I said, maybe next year. Give <laughs> right. me some time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by the way, I think a lot, of, a lot of locals don't hit the touristy spots because they consider them touristy. Yeah. But they're actually quite, it's like living in New York and you never go to the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. It's, you know, I think, first of all, I love the Wynwood Walls. Like, one of my favorite oh, yeah. places to go. But Ocean Drive is, you know, is, can be cool. And so many of these touristy spots are fun. So I run past and drive past Vizcaya. And I've lived in Miami for 28 years. Have you never been never. to I Vizcaya? I have never oh, been to Vizcaya. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I know. I just... We used to go to... Just one of those things, party. right? Like yeah. it's there and I just wow. never gone yeah. to Vizcaya. So maybe that's a goal of 2024. I like it. That's a good Let's one. do it. You're going to run. He's going to run all the steps of this guy. I don't, I don't even know if that's a lot of steps. steps. I don't you think swim. I think you probably swim more than you can run there. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Tanisha, any parting thoughts? You just finished the passing of the bar exam and admission. Any parting <laughs> advice for... The passing yeah. of the bar exam. Well, she took the bar exam and she got admitted to the bar. So what advice would you give to those law students out there who are anxious about that? Be anxious. It just sucks. It just is not fun. Yeah. You're so far removed from that. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Uh, you definitely have to be a little bit anxious, right? But you have to take it one step at a time, one day at a time, and just show up consistently as much as you can every single day. You're going to have to put the boundaries up with family members and friends who are in law school who might not necessarily understand, because I promise you the only people who know what you're going through is people who are going through it with you or people who have already gone through it. There's just no explaining it to anyone else, no matter how hard they try to understand. So I think the biggest issue a lot of 
people are facing when they experience the bar is just that, having to explain to, let's say, outsiders what you're going through, but also just sitting there and seeing the total number of hours you have to do a week and how much time you have left and how much work you have left. It will get overwhelming at some point, but you have to just break it down day by day and not lose momentum. I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. They get overwhelmed by it and give up and you just can't. All right. So. One foot in Good. front of the other. Exactly. Good. Right. Well, well, if, well said. Thank you, Tanisha. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, a great way to let us know would be to give us a five-star review or How do you share say the five-star episode? review in German. Or share the episode. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Give us one of those. Or share the episode with your friends and family. Follow the show, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Nelson. Thank, Thank you, Nelson, Tanisha. Tanisha, Thank Brett, you. Jeff. For more information on this show and other resources, visit fastamron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at Fast Amron. Fast Amron.